Thank you very much. Thank you, Alicia, for that nice introduction. And I'd also like to uh, thank the organizers of the conference for the invitation to attend. Um, as you could see from some of the presentations yesterday, FDA has a long history of collaboration with DTU and BFR and ANSYS. Indeed, uh, we've shared uh, lots of data and information over the years, and I expect that we'll continue to do that. And of course, we're, uh, we're collaborating, as Alicia mentioned in the introduction, with EFSA and with the European Commission. So uh, we're very pleased to have an office here in Brussels, and we think that really provides the opportunity to further our collaboration, and it also makes it possible for me to be here with you uh, today. So uh, I very much appreciate the, uh, the invitation. I'm also grateful for some of the points that the speakers made yesterday in defining the spectrum of products, and I think that's really important to keep in mind. We're working all the way from conventional foods to drugs, and so there were some very important distinctions that were made yesterday between foods, food additives, Dietary supplements, that's what we call them in the U.S. Here, they're food supplements for the main, most part. Herbal medicines and botanical drugs, that's what we call them in the U.S. And then medicines, because this really impacts how these products are regulated, what types of information we receive, and when we receive it. So today my talk will focus on dietary supplements, and in particular their constituent dietary ingredients, which includes botanicals. Uh, I think you'll see that there are many similarities in our regulatory framework. We also share some of the same challenges with our uh, fellow regulators, and you'll also see some differences. Okay, so this slide quickly, just to let you know a little bit about where this fits within our center. So within the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, we have product-oriented centers, and the center where dietary supplements is regulated is called the Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition. And in particular, the division that works on dietary supplements is our Division of Dietary Supplement Programs. Um, I've included the mission statement here for, uh, for CIFSAN, and you'll see this acronym throughout our, our presentation. But basically, we're, CIFSAN is charged with ensuring that the nation's food supply is safe, sanitary, wholesome, honestly and truthfully labeled, and also that cosmetic products are safe and properly labeled. So I think it's important to, to realize uh, or, or to take into account some of the regulation that pertains to our products. Just like Olga shared with you, the regulation here in the, U in the EU, we have regulation in the U.S. And our primary pieces of legislation that organize the way we work around dietary supplements are first and foremost the food, uh, Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. And this law provides most of the requirements that we'll be talking about in the remainder of the slides. The other one that's important, and here's another acronym, is the Dietary Supplement Health and Ed Education Act. This is the primary act in the United States that really tells us how to regulate dietary supplements. And this was enacted in 1994. Also, I'll talk just a little bit about some additional laws. One of them is the uh, Public Health Security and Bioterrorism Preparedness Act. This is the one that requires registration of facilities, and as you'll see, Part of most of FDA's regulation focuses in the post-market area. It's very important for us to know about the facilities and to be able to conduct inspections there. And then there was a law later I'll talk about that actually requires firms to update their registration information every two years. So here's some more information just about our regulatory framework. In 2006, there was another piece of legislation that was passed. This is the Dietary Supplement and Non-Prescription Drug Consumer Protection Act. This is often referred to as the SAR law. That stands for Serious Adverse Events Reporting. And I'll talk quite a bit about that in, in some subsequent slides. Uh, but this actually provides the requirement for dietary supplement firms to submit reports of serious adverse events to FDA and uh, is the requirement for that, uh, and this requirement is different than for conventional foods. And then finally, just recently in 2011, the U.S. passed the Food Safety Modernization Act. And this is the, the biggest overhaul of our food laws since, uh, since they were written back in the 1930s. And so we're actually in, in the process of writing up to 50 new regulations that will uh, streamline and enhance our food safety laws in the U.S. And this is the laws that actually apply to good manufacturing practices uh, and provide our regulatory authority over importers.
Okay, so I'm going to focus now for just a little bit on the Dietary Health Supplement uh, and Education Act, DSHEA. As was mentioned before, DSHEA provides the ma major regulatory framework in the U.S. for dietary supplement reg regulation. And it starts most importantly with identifying the category. Further, DSHEA provides pre-market review for some new dietary ingredients. It provides FDA authority to establish good manufacturing uh, practices for manufacturing products, which includes dietary supplements under the adulteration provisions, which means FDA can take enforcement actions against those products that aren't meeting the requirements, including safety standards. And again, these are safety standards that differ from conventional foods. As Deshea states, a dietary supplement is a product that is simply intended to supplement the diet. That is, a dietary supplement cannot be the sole item of a meal. The product must be intended for ingestion. Sublingual, topical, or injected products are not included. And it must contain at least one dietary ingredient listed here. Ingredients which are not on this list, like synthetic copies of plant constituents, cannot be used in dietary supplements. The major regulatory framework for dietary supplement reg regulations through DSHEA and the other previously listed laws can be distilled down into these main points, facility registration, new dietary ingredient notification, good manufacturing practices, labeling provisions, including structure function claim notification, and adverse event reporting. So I mentioned facility registration is important. This requirement initially comes from our bioterrorism laws, and it states that food facilities must register with FDA. Further, the Food Safety Modernization Act updates this requirement to say that, food, that facilities must renew their registration every two years, specifically during a particular period of the year, and that's what we're having now. In October, November, and December, all firms must renew their registration information. The registration isn't burdensome. It can be done electronically through FDA's portal on our website. And basically the information uh, that they go through in their registration includes the facility address, the type of facility, and a verification of who the responsible party is. The registration ends with the firm acknowledging that FDA can inspect the facility. And this is one of our primary regulatory tools. The new dietary ingredient or NDI notification requirement is for those products that contain a new dietary ingredient. And our definition of this is it's a dietary ingredient that was not marketed in a dietary supplement before October 15, 1994. And that's the date when the DSHEA law was signed in, uh, in, into law. This, this is a notification process and not an approval. So I mentioned before, there's a spectrum of products. and so. Pre-approval notification implies a different type of process than a notification process. And so this process for new dietary ingredients is a notification and review. It's not a, a necessarily an FDA approval. The manufacturer distributor is required to notify FDA of their new dietary ingredient at least 75 days prior to introducing the product into the market. During this 75 days, FDA reviews the notification and provides a response. Essentially, FDA's responses consist of two categories, an acknowledgement of the notification without objection or an acknowledgement with an objection. If a manufacturer or distributor sends the product to market over FDA's objection, then FDA has the burden of demonstrating that this product is unsafe before it can be removed from the market. That's very different than the standard for a, for a medicine. After 90 days, interestingly, um, the uh, NDI notifications are actually placed on public display on FDA's website. And so it's possible if you go on our website, you can see the results of these notifications. I checked today, and I think there's 189 notifications that you could uh, potentially check and take a look at. So the notification is required. It must describe the product and the ingredient as well as providing evidence of safety. FDA receives about 40 or 50 notifications each year and objects to many of them based on inadequate descriptions of the ingredient or inadequate safety. We believe that many products go to market without submitting the required notification, and we actually plan to submit additional draft guidance in 2015. 
I mentioned good manufacturing practices. This is something that's common to many products and is really one of the main tools that FDA has. A large part of FDA's post-market regulation of dietary supplements is based on GMP regulations. FDA published the final rule for GMP practices in June of 2007, and this rule can be found in the Code of Federal Regulations. Indeed, if you just Google something in this format, 21 CFR 11, the regulation will pop up. The regulation is an important tool to ensure dietary supplements are produced consistently and to high quality. The regulation has an emphasis on production and process controls and building quality into the product, as well as requirements for testing at the raw material and finished product stages. This is an extensive regulation that covers all aspects of manufacturing from setting up the facility and establishing personnel through product design, production and testing to records and record keeping. Dietary supplement GMPs are different from GMPs for other types of food. The GMPs are applicable to all firms who have involvement in the manufacturing and packaging, labeling, or holding of dietary supplements, and this applies to both domestic and foreign firms. FDA investigators confirm GMP compliance through hundreds of inspections each year, both domestic and foreign, and noncompliance can result in FDA action. In addition to manufacturing requirements, dietary supplements also have labeling requirements. As dietary supplements are a category of food, they must follow the food labeling regulations. And here I provide the citation for you to see those um, regulations. A few requirements that are specific to dietary supplements, different from other foods, would be that they must be labeled as a dietary supplement. Indeed, they must actually include a statement that describes them as a supplement. As with all foods, dietary supplements must include a list of ingredients, but the ingredients have to be formatted into a supplement's facts label. Additionally, dietary supplements must also contain the name and location of the manufacturer or distributor, but must also have contact for a U.S. agent, which consumers can submit adverse events to. This is a requirement that comes from the SAR law. And as you'll see, this is one of our main ways of actually acquiring information on adverse events is that the manufacturers or distributors are required to submit this to FDA within 15 days. In addition to the required aspects of the label, dietary supplements are afforded three types of claims in the U.S. The first of these claims would be nutrient content claims. As an example, this product might say that the product is high in calcium or another nutrient. Dietary supplements can also make structure function claims regarding the effect a product has on the structure or function of the body. An example might be calcium helps build strong bones. Finally, dietary supplements can make some health claims or qualified health claims. The last type requires FDA approval in the form of a regulation which spells out exactly what the firms can say. And you can find these examples on FDA's website. Uh, an example would be a claim regarding calcium and vitamin D, and osteoporosis. I'll talk a little bit more about structure, function, and health claims in a couple of slides that follow. When, fir when firms decide to make structure function claims, they must understand that the requirements associated with these claims. That is, it's the firm's responsibility to have substantiation that the claim they are making is truthful. They can't just make the claim because their competitors are saying it. Firms must notify FDA of their claim within 30 days of marketing the product. Firms must uh, include the disclaimer, this statement has not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Otherwise, this would be a drug. And so again, this, this is different and shows how there's a, a, a different approach to regulating dietary supplements than we take for medicines. In the next slide, I'll talk a little bit more about how we handle these notifications. So when firms submit their notifications for making a structure function claim, their notification must include the text of the claim. Remember, that's going to be in the regulation. Then FDA reviews this claim to ensure they aren't making a disease claim so that they're staying within the bounds of a dietary supplement. As is the case with NDI notifications, structure function notifications do not receive approval from FDA. Rather, if their claim is found to be violative, for example, if they're making a disease claim, 
FDA will send a letter to the firm notifying them of this fact. FDA investigators will then follow up with the firm if violative claims are not fixed. If the claim is appropriate, however, they will receive no response from FDA. We also expect to move to an electronic submission of these notifications sometime next year. Now I'd like to talk about adverse event reporting because I think this is very important and as was highlighted by some of the presentations yesterday, this is actually where we can become aware of some uh, serious problems and be able to take action. FDA's post-market surveillance includes adverse event reporting. Again, this is a result of the Sauer Law in which dietary supplements must submit uh, sub serious adverse events to FDA for review. The reporting system works through FDA's MedWatch program, and the submissions can be received through an electronic portal, email, phone call, or letters. While manufacturers are required to submit these reports, consumers and healthcare providers can do it voluntarily. If a manufacturer receives an adverse event report and determines it is serious, they have 15 days to forward it to FDA. A year later, they're supposed to provide an update with any new or relevant information. In the next slide, I'll talk about what we do with this information when we receive it. Once the reports are entered into MedWatch, the dietary supplement-specific adverse event reports are further uh, entered into the CIFSAN adverse event reporting system database. From this database, the Division of Dietary Supplement Programs reviewers will evaluate the cases and determine if any follow-up with the submitter is needed. While an adverse event report is not causal, the reviewer will hopefully be able to review the information and determine if the dietary supplement product is at fault. The reviewers are also responsible for recognizing any triggers that may be evident with specific firms, products, or ingredients. And I'll talk a little bit about triggers. If a trigger is identified, FDA action may result in a facility inspection. These are generally referred to as for-cause inspections. Additionally, a product recall may be necessary. If a firm doesn't believe the recall is necessary, but FDA does, we may issue a public warning that consumers avoid certain products or ingredients due to safety concerns. And a couple of recent examples of these triggers uh, would be action on HydroxyCut, a popular weight loss product, and Oxy Elite Pro, uh, more recent sports enhancement and weight loss product. And you can see information on our, on our website that describe the, these products. Both of these products show several cases of liver damage that was able to be traced to the product, although we weren't able to specifically trace it to a specific ingredient. In both cases, the products were recalled. So just to wrap up what's been covered, FDA's regulatory authority with dietary supplements, most of our authority is focused in the post-market surveillance as opposed to pre-market review. Examples of which include good manufacturing compliance, inspections, product labeling, and adverse event reporting. As Alicia mentioned, I'm a veterinary pathologist, and so I, I do have uh, some experience in toxicology testing, but because these regulations are very specific, I wanted to provide you with some contact information from some of our program people. And so this presentation should be available to you after the conference. Uh, you're free to reach out directly to the program contact or myself, and we'll try to get any questions answered. Thank you very much.